You are listening to a sermon by Pastor Christopher Sally of New Life Christian Fellowship Church. By those prophets called the OJs. Amen. No. Amen. For the love of money. And so we're in this series, as you know, Wisdom from Old School Radio. And, and uh, we've kind of fallen into this. This is the third message around really around stewardship, around how to think about your resources. And it started with Luke chapter 12 with don't believe the hype, amen, in terms of a man's life is not, does not consist with the abundance of his possessions. In short, a man's, your, 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 uh, your self-worth is not represented by your what? Your net worth, amen. And so Jesus was very pointed in his teaching in Luke chapter 12 about that with the, with the, uh, the rich man who built those barns, amen. And then we went from there to more money, more problems. Amen. <laughs> we talked about first Timothy chapter six and we and we kind of dealt with that. And then and then uh, the last time we were together, it was cash rules, everything around me. Cream. Amen. And so that was out of Luke chapter 16, where we really started to drill down a little bit on this this subject of stewardship. And so I've decided that we're going to try to I don't say finish dealing with this in, in, in a, I don't say in a short way, but in a hopefully a pointed way for you that we talked about stewardship being a truth, that it was revolutionary and it was relevant and it was real. And then we talked about these, I told you that we we're going to deal with three precepts, three principles, three priorities, three practices, three problems, and three pursuits. And so if you were here, you hopefully wrote that down and we're going to try to fill that fill that out for you and the last time we were together when we talked about uh, Luke chapter 16 we we talked about these three precepts and I'll just review these for your edification that stewardship is a trust amen you have to use money and and not waste it because it leads to true wisdom that's what verse 9 is reminding us about there that stewardship was also a what a test. You use money and don't abuse it because it leads to true riches. And we spent some time, good time, I thought, talking about uh, Exodus and the children of Israel and talking about the, the compromises that Pharaoh tried to get the Israelites to make that represent the same compromises that Satan tries to get you to make in your life. And so that when he said that you can worship right in the land, go but don't go far, uh, go but don't take anybody with you, and then ultimately go take everybody with you but leave all of your wealth in Egypt. Those were those traps that we talk about that, that he wanted, uh, the, the, the trap of religion, which is just not change anything and just worship where you are. The trap, the, the, the trap of recreation where you go, but don't go far. Don't, don't do anything serious as a Christian. The trap of relaxation, which was don't be on fire for the Lord and try to take anybody with you. And ultimately that last trap, that trap of robbery, which is go take everybody with you, but leave your money in Egypt. Amen. And the reason that Pharaoh did that and the reason that Satan does that as well is because if you leave your money in Egypt, Pharaoh knows what? You will be back. Amen. And the scripture assures us of that when it says where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. And what I love about what Moses said is, no, we can't do that because we have to take everything with us because we don't know what our God will require of us. But we know we need to have everything with us. So, again, we didn't want to fall into that trap and stewardship is a task. And then we also said stewardship was a task. Use money and don't serve it because it leads to true service. That was verse 13. And then we talked about these three principles in Luke chapter 16. Again, just reviewing for uh, those that weren't here. The three principles of stewardship are look ahead, plan ahead, and finally do what? move ahead. Amen. So many times uh, we're so busy in our lives that we just don't take the time to actually look ahead and see what's on the horizon and be able to make a move based upon what we see. And the, and the unjust steward, as he is described in Luke chapter 16, was commended by Christ because he, at the very least, did those three things. He looked ahead. He realized he had a problem. Then he planned ahead 
And he came up with a plan and he then executed that plan. Somewhere in there being a good steward, some of us don't look ahead. Some of us don't plan ahead. But then some of us actually look ahead and plan ahead, but then actually don't what? Don't move ahead. So many plans that we have that are great that we just don't execute on. He did all three. That's what made him commendable in the eyes of Christ, even though he was described as an unjust steward. And so when it comes to your resources and understanding this truth of stewardship, which is a steward means you and I are managers. We're not owners. God owns everything. We just manage it on his what? His behalf. That is a, that is a revolutionary way to look at your resource management because you thought you owned it or you might have been given the impression that you did, but you don't. He owns everything and he entrusts you to manage it, it is it is found in the steward that a man it must it is required of stewards. It says in First Corinthians four and two that a man be found what faithful. So stewardship is really about being faithful to what God has designed and outlined for us in terms of how we manage our resources. And so I gave you a recipe for how to manage your money. Amen. I said. It, very simply, it should be 0, 10, 20, 30, what? 40. Good. It's, even if you weren't here, you should know that 40 was next. Amen. Very smart. Very, very astute crowd. 0, 10, 20, 30, 40. I encouraged us that in a, in a very broad way that we should allocate 0% to debt, 10% to giving. When I pause, that means you fill it in. You see how that works? 20% to savings, 30% to taxes, dear God, and 40% to consumption. Amen. And the reason that, that I'm suggesting, and there's a biblical foundation for that, that we approach our resource management or the recipe for that in that way is that if we can allocate 0% to debt, we will stop greed. Amen. Amen. We're going to dig into that a little bit, a uh, little bit today, but to, to stop greed because, because greed is a, is a, uh, uh, debt is, is actually a spiritual problem and it requires a spiritual solution. And so if we can stop debt, that means we need to start contentment. Amen. Because the answer to greed is contentment. So the first thing is 0% to debt to stop greed, 10% to giving to do what? So to God, amen. So meaning S-O-W, so to God. 20% to savings to save for goals, amen. 30% to taxes to support the government and 40% to consumption to satisfy with goods, amen. And so I want us to, to, to dig in just a little bit on the 0% and the 10% uh, today, and then we'll, then we'll move on to those priorities and practices and problems and pursuits next time. But let's, let's dig in a little bit on this, this concept of 0% to, to debt. And I want us to be able to take, I don't say we'll call it a little, a little, a little, a little test, if you will, because we live in a society that is all about what? Immediate gratification. Amen. Everything you, you look at the commercials that will tell you that you, you need to get this. They'll tell you, not only do you need to get it, you need to get it when now. And the other thing is you need to get it because you deserve it. Amen. That's that's all part of feeding into our uh, the culture that we live in, this American culture that really is all about immediate gratification and nobody should have to wait for anything. And they really play upon that. But that really taps into our greed and it really taps into our lack of contentment and the Lord says that in first Timothy six. And we went over this before that godliness with contentment is great gain. Amen. Gain is not great gain. Godliness with contentment is great gain. So let's see. Uh, there's probably there are five things. Is it five? Yeah. There's five things that might show that you or I have a debt problem. Amen. And so the first one would be this. 
if you're living on credit instead of cash, you might have a debt problem. Amen? Well, how do you know? Because your balance keeps going up. Amen. If you've got several credit cards and they're all maxed out, and you, you know, if, if, that's, if that's where you are right now in your financial life, you might have a debt problem. This is really about patience and contentment. I want it now, but I know I cannot afford it now. Amen? And, 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 and there's a dangerous presumption that gets made that you will be able to pay it all back tomorrow. It'll always be better tomorrow. Tomorrow, tomorrow. So Annie, tomorrow is always a day away. Yeah, it's always a day away and 15% interest away. But it's always a day away. You know what I found out? Uh, how, if you've ever been to, 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 to Disney World, and, and it's, they say it's a, it's a mouse, but it, it's really a big rat. It's a really a big rat. It's great. I love Disney. I'm a big Disney fan. But they did something ingenious. When you check in, especially if you live, if you live, if, if, if you if you stay on property, they immediately what they do is they issue you a Disney card. Ingenious. It's ingenious. Why? Because they say, listen, just put it all on this magical little purple Disney card that we're giving you. And what it's supposed to do is make you think that all of the money that you're spending in Disney World, all, you know, it's not just the rides, but it's all of the food and all of the other stuff is almost like Disney money. It's just play money. Don't worry about it. It's all on the little card. But the little card is linked to the big card that you checked into the hotel with. And at the end of your five day stay where you haven't been paying attention to all that you and the little mouse and the kids have been doing, that bill is waiting for you. But if you had to pull out your credit card every time you did something, you might think about it. If you had to pay cash for it every time you thought about it, you'd have to do something. And, and so, again, we, we get lulled into this place where it's dangerous, where we, where we just spend money because it, it doesn't seem like it's real money. But when you have to pay it back, trust me, beloved, it's real. It's real. It's, it's, this is a spiritual issue. It's not a financial issue. Why? Because mismanaged money is usually an indication of a mismanaged life. A lack of stewardship in money is usually an indication of a lack of stewardship in life. That's why stewardship is a test. I don't know why it is, but God says I can learn so much about you by how you manage the money that I have given you to manage. Amen? And so if you and I are living on credit instead of cash, we might have a debt problem. The, sec the second thing that might be an indication that you might be just a little out of, uh, out of scale with in terms of how you're managing your money would be this. If you're unable to do any of the following, you might have a debt problem. Tithe, save, or pay your taxes. Amen? If you're not saving, if you're not tithing, slash giving or you're not paying your taxes that would be a strong indication something is out of scale in terms of how you are managing your money amen amen the third thing would be this if you're only paying the minimum on your credit card bills or delaying payment altogether you might have a debt problem especially if you take the checks that they can issue you from one credit card to pay the balance, minimum balance down, come on somebody, on another credit card. Okay, maybe, maybe that was just me. I, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe, maybe you got all of your stuff together, but I can recall a time in my life being enamored with the fact that I had all of these credit card balances and this was up and this was up and, and, and trying to scheme and plot to pay $50 here from this over here and over there. If you're doing that, if that's your hustle, if that's the way you're balancing everything out, you might have a, you might have a debt problem. Amen. Number four, you know, it, 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 listen, it, it's, it's okay. It, it's okay if I'm on your street. I am. It, it's okay. I know. I'm just the messenger here, though. And so if you're quiet, you can be quiet as long as you listen to what I'm saying. Amen. You ain't, you're not going to stop. 
Yeah, you think that's what's going to stop me? But y'all just putting your heads down and being quiet? Shoot, I'm going to preach this thing. I'm going to do it by myself. Number four, if you're living above your means, amen, or making outsized purchases, trying to keep up with the Joneses, you might have a debt problem. Amen? If you feel like you have to have the latest because somebody else has the latest and you haven't even gone through any kind of discipline around why all you know is the new iPhone 6s is out. Am I speaking? I know I'm speaking to somebody now. Haven't, haven't, haven't talked to Jesus at all about the iPhone 6. Haven't looked at anything about the iPhone. All you know is it's out. And if it's out, I'm getting it. And credit means get it. Credit means get it. That's what it means, doesn't it? Get it. And get it when? Now. I can get it now. The new Apple Watch is out. Getting it. Got it. Got it. Doing it. The Air Jordan 256 edition such and such special only got 300 made. Getting it. Getting it. Why? Because credit means get it. Let me give you, let me give you an example. It's a real example. Real example. You got a new apartment and God bless you. You did new apartment or even let's say even better. You got a new house. You've been saving up. You got this house. You finally got this house. I remember how excited me and sister Kim were when we bought our first house in South Holland and we put that key in the door and there was nobody in there. We looked at each other and say, dang, this is our house. <laughs> and nobody could tell us to be quiet. My mother's not hanging around saying, stop dribbling that ball in this house. None of that. It's my house. If I want to dribble the ball in my house, I'll dribble the ball in my house. Exciting, your house. But now you got to think about your relatives. Amen? And it's like, ooh, mama and them, and it's always the and them that'll mess you up. Amen? Mama and them going to come over, and they want to see the house. So we got to have a house warming. We got to have a something. But you don't have no furniture. You barely got in the house. God bless you. You got in the house. It was in your budget. But you don't have in your budget to completely furnish your house now. But mom and them coming over. And apparently that means something to you because you now have rushed out to one of the worst places in the world to go rent a center. Amen. Or you went someplace else. Value City. You went someplace. You said, I'm getting ready to get all of this. Why? Because... Mama and them coming over. They can't see me with an empty house and I got credit and credit means what? Get it. So you get it. You get $5,000 worth of furniture. 15% interest. Just nice round numbers. 15%. And it's good. Mom and them have a good time. Everybody's great. Oh, your house is so beautiful, beautiful. Okay, and then they leave. Now you stuck with the bill. So the next month, you pay $100 minimum payment okay hundred dollar minimum payment on five thousand dollars fifteen percent interest it will take you 79 months to pay off that furniture just pay a hundred dollars a month fifteen percent interest five percent trust me the math is right 79 months it'll take you to pay that furniture off now think about this Say you opened up a bank account and you could earn 5% interest. So it's, maybe it's not a bank account. It's got to be a little bit more aggressive since the, the interest rates are so low. But anyways, let's say you can earn 5%. Take that same $100, put it in an account every month, every month. That same $100, now you are a lender, not a borrower, in 46 months, which makes sense because if it was no interest, it'd be $4,600. But that'll grow to $5,000. In 46 months, you will have $5,000. You can walk into the place that you wanted to go, get that furniture, pay cash for it. What's the problem? You have to wait, what, 46 months. But I don't want to wait 46 months. But if you don't wait 46 months, what does it cost you? I'll tell you exactly what it costs you. You wait 46 months, you buy cash. And then you keep using that $100 a month, $100 a month, $100 a month, just as you save. At the end of 79 months, on the one example, all you've got is furniture. In the, in the example, if you're a saver, 
You bought it. You had to wait 46 months. But at the end of 79 months, you got $3,500 in the bank. And when your furniture wears out, if you just keep doing that $100 a month, you'll never have to pay credit for furniture again because you will have a furniture account, if you will, and you'll be paying cash for it every single time. All you need to do is wait. And if you don't want to wait, it'll cost you, in this example, $3,500. All you need to do is put on the invitation to mama and them, B-Y-O-C. Bring your own chair. Amen? That's all you got to do. I don't care what your cousin says about he ain't got no friend. Nobody asked him or her anything. B-Y-O-C. B-Y-O-F, your own food. B-Y-O-C again, bring your own couch. B-Y-O-T, bring your own TV. I'm trying to do something here, amen? And if you can't stand up for yourself, it's going to cost you $3,500. And mama and them will be all right. I don't care what they say. You got the house, right? And you could dribble the ball in the house. And you can run the shower in the house. You can run all the hot water out. You can do whatever you wish. It's your house, amen? And so we have to be able to be smart in terms of not living above our means. The last thing I'll tell you, gravitate towards, you might have a debt problem. If you gravitate towards get rich quick ideas. <laughs> if you are the person that I don't care what multi-level marketing scheme comes out, you were thinking it's a good idea, you might, just might have a debt problem. Just might. Every single one. There is no, multi even if you are rich and you try to get it with Bernie Madoff, if somebody is saying that they're gonna, it's going to average 37% returns over oh, something just, if it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. Even if it's Bernie Madoff, even if it's some high finance kind of thing, you should always, something that your, your spidey sense, amen, your spidey sense should be tingling, amen, that something might not be right. And if I can tell you that I, I can, you can invest this and it will, it will triple your money in two days and this will happen and that will happen, it's probably not going to happen. There's something wrong. And people that are in that kind of thing and do that kind of hustle, they prey on the desperation of those that want to get something for nothing. And it's, and it's not, and it doesn't necessarily flow from a bad place. You just trying to, you trying to come up. Amen. I get it, but you can't come up except as the song says on the rough side of the mountain. That's usually how it works. You don't come up on the smooth side. That, that, that's just not how it usually works. If you're going to do it, it's the scripture talks about little by little is wealth, is wealth grown. Amen. It's not these big moves. It's not some big, sometimes that can be the story and it, sometimes it checks out, but more than likely, whatever you and I have access to is going to be a scam. Hey Amen. you couldn't have invested with Bernie Madoff if you wanted to. And then he scammed somebody. So again, you didn't get into debt overnight, you won't get out of debt overnight. And I'm not even sure if you got some money from the get rich quick scheme, you'd even pay off the debt that you have. You might be another opportunity for you to get some more furniture and do some more stuff you don't have no business doing because mama and them coming over. Dear God. So what should you do? Real talk. Real talk. What should you do? You should seek forgiveness. That's the first thing. Again, you need to talk to the Lord and confess your undoneness to him and say, I want to do better. I know, like, again, you didn't get into debt overnight. You're not going to get out overnight. But to be able to acknowledge, I have made some mistakes in how I have managed your money. I'm the steward. You're the owner. Listen, Lord, I have not done right by you and how I've managed your money. Please forgive me. That is, an, that is an amazingly important step just to be able to admit I, I, I have not come at this thing the way I should have. And you say, I, I need to seek some forgiveness. The second thing you and I need to do if we have a debt problem is stop overspending. Amen. 
The scripture says in Proverbs 21 and 17, he that loveth pleasure shall be a poor man. He that loveth wine and oil shall not be rich. If you keep spending on stuff that you, that you see and you want everything, you'll never be able to have everything and you won't actually be able to save anything. Amen. So you and I have to stop overspending. Amen. Say it with me. Stop overspending. Amen. Don't worry about what everybody else is doing. You have to do what's right before God. Better is the sight of the eyes, it says in Ecclesiastes 6 and 9, uh, than the wandering of the desire. That is also vanity and vexation of spirit. It's a little awkward in the King James to pick up what he's saying, but he's saying better is the sight of the eyes than the wandering of the desire. What he's really saying is it's better to look at your plate and eat what's on it then always be looking at somebody else's plate and, and wanting what's over there. Just eat what's on your plate, man. That's what we served you. Eat that. Don't say, Ooh, I like, no, no, eat here. So you always get in trouble if you won't take what was for you and you're trying to get what somebody else has. Amen. That's what Ecclesiastes 6, Ecclesiastes 6 and 9 is saying. So seek forgiveness, stop overspending. And I know this is, don't, don't, don't throw a shoe at me. Amen. But the third thing you need to do is start budgeting. Oh, Lord, did he just say budget? I didn't cuss at you. I just said budget. Amen. That's a biblical concept. Proverbs 27, 23 and 24 says this. Be thou diligent to know the state of thy flocks and look well to thy herds for riches are not forever and doth the crown endure to every generation. It says, listen, be diligent. You have to know what you are spending. Amen. So the first thing you could do and I've done this before and it's very good and it's very practical is to be able to write down everything you spend in a given month. Everything. If you give somebody 10 cents to go get a piece of bubble gum, write it down. Whatever it is, whatever you spend, whatever big, small, you do that for 30 days and then you look back, you will have a very good idea how you are wasting your money. You and I may realize, my goodness, I didn't realize I spend $200 a month at Starbucks. You might not know that. And you might have no idea that that, 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 that caramel macchiato, grande, venti macchiato, you get that, you get one in the morning, you get one in the afternoon, you get in a muffin hit. You could look up and that could be two. And when you, when you think of it that way, it's like, oh my gosh, that's, that's an area. Maybe if I could cut that down, I could do something else with that. But you'll never know if you never keep track of it. Amen. So start budgeting, start keeping track of what you spend. And then the, the fourth thing would be this, sacrifice consuming, sacrifice consuming. Usually in, the, in, 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 this, in this recipe, 10%, if, you, if you're doing what you're supposed to do, you don't cut God out of that. 20% you shouldn't cut out. 30% the government's going to snatch what they're going to snatch anyway. In this, pair, in this recipe, they, they get theirs up front. The only thing you can cut is what? Consumption. You got to stop spending. You have to, you have to sacrifice consuming. Cut those expenses. Like I said, if it was Starbucks for 200 bucks, and maybe if you can cut that down to God bless you to a hundred dollars a month, make some coffee at home. Amen. Do your nails at home. Amen. Get your hair done once every three weeks instead of once a week. There's a whole bunch of things that we can do that you can look at and then take that real tangible money and then pay something off, pay something down, get a handle on things. You can start small, but if you start small, the scripture says little by little is wealth accumulated. Seek forgiveness, stop overspending, start budgeting, sacrifice consuming. And then the last thing is stay the course. Stay the course. Galatians 6, 9 says, don't be weary in well-doing. For if we do what? If we wait, we persevere, we will reap a reward. You have to stay the course. It may, you, you start small, you may not see a whole lot happening right away, but you and I need to stay the course and keep doing it, persevere, let not us be weary and well-doing, actually, for in due season, we will reap if we faint not, amen? In due season, it's coming, we'll reap if we persevere, if we stay the course, if we faint not. So don't be discouraged, seek forgiveness, stop overspending, start budgeting, sacrifice consuming, stay the course. And there's some people in the world that, that um, 
have a handle on their ha- have a handle on their money. But I-, I would tell you this: if if you don't recognize first and foremost that you are that you are a steward, and you if you don't understand it's a God thing, you don't understand the spiritual aspects of it. You can get a handle on your finances, and it can be great for you. But it's the same way. To be honest with you, it's the same way like going to a university and auditing a class. You're not registered for the class. You're not going to get credit for the class. Amen. You know the principles of the class, but when we look at the official registration, you're not in the class. So if you're not in the class, come on, meaning you're not in the kingdom, you're not a believer, you, you can get a great handle on this, but that's like getting an A in the class uh, that you audited. You don't really get credit for it. You need to enroll in the class. Come on, somebody. And when you enroll in the class and you understand the principles and you do what you're supposed to do, then you will get credit for it. And that's the kind of credit you want. Amen. Not the other kind of credit that we always seem to be gravitating towards. So that's why I say you and I should do zero percent to debt, to stop greed. Contentment is our answer. Godliness with contentment is great gain. And then here's here's a a, a encouragement around 10 percent to to giving. And of course, you can spend a lot of time talking about a lot of different things about about giving. And and I'm not going to do that this morning. I just want to give you three um, points of encouragement of our giving. Amen. And again, understanding that tithing is really the beginning of what the Lord would desire. It's, it's, it's the minimum. It's not the maximum. But you're doing it to honor God. And, and, and it's commended in the New Testament. It's not, it's not commanded in the New Testament. Amen. But Jesus commends it. Uh, tithing in Matthew 23 and 23. Amen. So again, it's a standard that, that is set. And is actually set before the law. Because I think it's in Genesis 13 or 14. When Moses. Moses. Excuse me. When Abraham met Melchizedek. He honored him by giving him a tenth. That just that is a good amount that, that God says it, it, it honors me. So that's where it comes from. And again, Jesus is, is not a, Jesus is about fulfilling the law. Amen. So it, it's not commanded in the New Testament, but it's definitely commended. And he had a conversation with the Pharisees around it. So let's just say that that's that's the standard that God sets. That's what he desires from you. It is achievable, it's reachable, because actually, if we were looking at the law, um, they actually had three tithes. You, you, you could be giving up. You know, if we we're going to go by the law, we'd be giving up 30 percent of our money. Dear God, it'd be like the government. Amen. <laughs> and so and so God just says, I want you to honor me. That's what this is about. It's not about anybody trying to hustle anybody about it out of anything. And let me tell you about what I would say is the true greatness of giving. Three things. Giving gives three things for you as a believer that I just want you to remember today. I mean, like I said, we could spend more time on this subject. I just want to emphasize these three things as we close. Giving helps you to have gratitude for the past. Amen. Gratitude for the past. It's really based upon all that God has done. Amen. And we are thankful and grateful to give to show it. Amen. Gratitude for the gratitude for the past. And so in first Chronicles, uh, verse verse chapter 29 first chronicles chapter 29 when david was I believe it was david was collecting to, to to do something in terms of building no excuse me solomon and building the temple and in first chronicles 29 it's really verses 10 through 13 Actually, it is David, like I said. Okay. He was encouraging the people to bring things. So 1 Chronicles 29, 10 through 13, give us a real, a, a real good uh, reference for this gratitude for the past. David said, wherefore, David blessed the Lord before all the congregation. And David said, blessed be thou, Lord God of Israel, our father forever and ever. Thine, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty. For all that is in heaven and in earth is thine. 
Thine is the kingdom, O Lord, and thou art exalted as head above all. Both riches and honor come of thee, and thou reignest over all. In thine hand is power and might, and in thine hand it is to make great and to give strength unto all. Now, therefore, our God, we thank thee and praise thy glorious name. Amen. Again, this is in terms of him beginning to collect some things or the people's offerings around things. He's like, listen, we have to understand how great is our God. It helps us to give gratitude for the past. Now, the world would tell you that's complete absurdity. But the people of God will tell you that that's complete clarity. Amen. It's the difference between the world viewing you uh, giving as absurdity and, and, and the people of God and God's, and God's word saying that, no, that's complete clarity. That's clarity to understand that you and I should have gratitude for the past because God indeed is what? Good. You don't have to say amen if you don't want to, but God is good. Amen. And he's done things for you and I that nobody else could do. Amen. And so giving to God and to his house and supporting his pastors and his and, and his and his place and his purposes is a good thing. It gives gratitude for the past. The second thing it does, it gives grounding in the present. Amen. It gives grounding in the present. Why? Because when you give, it is a constant reminder that it's not all about you. Amen. I know that there are times in our lives that we actually think it's all about us. It's not. And, 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 and grounding in the present, the world would see that as a liability. But the people of God and the kingdom of God would say that's an opportunity. It's not a liability. It's an opportunity. It's a constant reminder that is not, it's not all about me. I am a steward and I'm a manager of what the owner provides. And so our text that we read uh, this, this morning, uh, before we started the sermon in second Corinthians is a, is a beautiful text to help you. And I remember it's not all about us. If you read those passages, you see that there are three, there is a creator of the gift. There is a contributor of a gift. And then there's the consumer of the gift. Amen. There's a creator, there's a contributor, and there is a consumer. And, and, and when you and I know that the creator of the gift obviously is God, and, and when you see that when you give, the creator of the gift gets enlarged. Amen? Verses 11 and 12 say, being enriched in everything to all bountifulness, which causes through us thanksgiving to God. God gets enlarged because he gets what? He gets magnified for the, for the administration of this supply to the saints is an abundantly, uh, is also made by thanksgiving, abundant thanksgiving given unto God. Again, God gets enlarged when you give, amen? Because somebody uh, gets blessed by that and they began to praise God for it, amen? And so the creator of the gift gets what? enlarged the consumer of the gift gets encouraged amen the consumer of the gift no doubt gets encouraged because you supply the needs of God's people and you encourage and they're encouraged by your active faith it, and it says that in verse 13 of, the, of of that scripture so the consumer gets encouraged the creator gets enlarged and the contributor of the gift which is you gets enriched Amen. You get enriched. And verse 11 says, being enriched in every way to all bountifulness, which causes through us thanksgiving to God. There is something that you get in on when you give. There's a reminder, the consumer of the gift is encouraged. The contributor gets enriched and the creator of the gift, God himself gets enlarged. And look at what verse 8 says. This is what I really, really love. And God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. Verse 10, now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your what? Righteousness. Listen, you get in on a grace exchange when you give. It's not money for money. Too many times you hear that. If you give this, you will get this back. You give me $10 today, I will give you $100 tomorrow. You pull this lever, you pull it down, and you can say money cometh, and that's exactly what God. That is not what God is doing. Amen? 
He says here, I will enlarge your store of what? Seed. Not your, I will enlarge your store of seed. Seed is desired to do what? To be planted. I will give you more control over more seed. What I will enlarge for you is what? A harvest of money. No, a harvest of righteousness. That's what I'll enlarge. You keep getting in on what I'm doing. I will enrich you, not necessarily with money, but I will give you everything that you need. Remember, it says each of you should give what you've decided to give cheerfully. And God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. He will give you the grace to abound in every good work. That's the greatness of giving. Amen. Gratitude for the past is grounding in the present because you and I realize it's bigger than us, that there's something we get in on when God gets enlarged, the, the consumer of the gift gets uh, uh, encouraged and we get enriched to be able to have more seed to be able to sow and get in on what God is doing. And the last thing it is, is growth for the future. Growth for the future. And the world will tell you that's that's calamity. No. And God's people will say, no, that's security. Growth. What growth are you talking about, pastor? You start to lay up treasure in heaven. Mm hmm. Come on, somebody. Where moth and rust don't consume and thieves don't break through and steal. You enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. We just talked about that in verse 10 of 2 Corinthians 9. You're trusted with more. As you talk about Luke chapter 19, uh, the, 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 the parable uh, that's in Luke chapter 19. That when the, when the, 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 uh, the owner comes back and he says, what did you do with what I gave you? And, and then those that were able to invest and do what they were supposed to do with the resources God gave them. He said, now take uh, control over this many cities to do this. You've been a faithful servant. You did what you were supposed to do. You're trusted with, with more. And all my needs get met as grace abounds towards me. All of that is growth for the future. Amen. That's the greatness of giving. And that's all I want to say about it today. It's gratitude for the past. It's grounding in the presence. It, it's growth for the future. So my encouragement is, why would we not want to get in on what God is doing? But you and I can't do that if our finances are all over the place and we are outscaled and outsized in what we're consuming. And then we literally leverage that up by our greed with debt. So that we are consuming, if we looked at it, 80, 90, 100 percent with that of what God has given us control over. And we don't are not able to save. We're not able to tithe. We're not even able to fully pay our taxes. That is a tragedy and a mismanaged financial situation is an indication of a mismanaged life. But the good news is you don't have to stay that way anymore. Amen. If you know better, then you can begin to, to do better. You seek forgiveness and we start to do some concrete steps to change some things around small steps, little by little. God will honor that. He will meet us where we are and bring us where we need to be. Amen. Be encouraged today that you and I are stewards and that the truth of the word of God is that we have an accountability to our master to manage our money well. Amen. And so we'll look at this one more week next uh, next week and go through and deal with these other series of threes and just finish off that encouragement around how we are to to look at our finances. Uh, let's just bow on a word of prayer. Father, thank you for this day.